Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Adrian O'Neill, Ireland's ambassador to the United Kingdom and you're very welcome to the embassy here in London. Today's centenary conversation marks the Government of Ireland Act, which received royal assent on the 23rd of December 1920. It forms part of a broader, broader dialogue over recent years, reflecting on key moments in history across these islands in the years between 1912 and 1923. Recognising the many differing perspectives on those key moments, one of the guiding principles of this commemorative programme has been that we should seek to broaden sympathies without abandoning loyalties. We are now turning to some of the most sensitive moments in that decade of centenary. Partition, the War of Independence, the Truce, the Anglo-Irish Treaty, Civil War, and the early founding years of Northern Ireland and the Irish Free State. Yesterday, a new commemoration series of discussions was launched in Dublin by President Higgins, Machnav 100. In his address, President Higgins noted that commemoration, quote, offers the opportunity to reflect, to look deeply at change over time, to provide an understanding of where things have been, where they are today, and why. And it is that why that brings us here today. The hope, indeed the ambition, that by better understanding our past, we can illuminate and perhaps even navigate the complexities of the present. I'm delighted that such a distinguished panel of historians are here today to tease out the context that led up to the Government of Ireland Act 1920 and to explore its impact and legacy across these islands. And to introduce that panel, I will hand over now to our equally distinguished moderator, journalist, writer and history enthusiast, Fergal Keane. So over to you, Fergal. Thank you, Ambassador. This month, we remember the signing of the Government of Ireland Act. Its purpose was to establish two parliaments on the island of Ireland, one for the six northeastern counties of what is to be called Northern Ireland, and another for the 26 counties of what now form the Republic of Ireland. The Irish War of Independence led to the abandonment of the Home Rule Project in the South and the creation of the Irish Free State in 1922. Northern Ireland opted to remain fully a part of the United Kingdom. And however much its internal structures of governance, its relationships with Dublin and London have changed, the six northeastern counties have remained an entity within the United Kingdom. Partition has endured. With me to discuss this important moment in the history of these islands is a panel of distinguished historians. Cuiva Nick Goved is a senior lecturer in modern history at the University of Sheffield and the author, among other works, of terrorist histories individuals and political violence in the 19th century. Ian McBride is the Foster Professor of Irish History at Hertford College, Oxford. He's recently been co-editor of the Princeton History of Modern Ireland. Patricia Clavin is Professor of International History at Jesus College, Oxford. She's a recipient of the British Academy Medal for her book, Securing the World Economy, The Reinvention of the League of Nations. And Dr. Niamh Gallagher of St. Catherine's College, Cambridge, her book, Ireland and the Great War, A Social and Political History, won the Royal Historical Society's 2020 Whitfield Prize. Um, I'm going to start by going around the panel uh, and asking you individually to spell out why this matters. Why should we be remembering and analysing at this point in history the Government of Ireland Act? Niamh Gallagher. Thank you, Fergal, and can I just thank the Irish Embassy as well for inviting me here today. So the Government of Ireland Act is an incredibly important moment within the island of Ireland, but also between the two islands. From a historian's point of view, my own view, I think it is neither a starting point nor an end point when we think about the politics within that space. I think there are perhaps four different lenses that we can use to look at it, which are all of interest in understanding more about our history. We can think about uh, the act as being a culmination to the long-standing problem of t about what to do over home rule, and particularly the question of what to do about Ulster. So it can be seen as a culmination of that debate in a way. It might also be looked at in a different framing. We might think about it as part of the reinvigorated discussion after the Easter Rising from 1916, 
through to the end of the Boundary Commission in 1925. But we might also think about it as part of the global set of imperial and international problems that arose after the end of the First World War. Or you might well think about it as something that still continues to mobilise our politics today. Not least when we think about the Irish border, what to do in this um, moment of Brexit that we're still waiting to see what the outcome is. I think regardless of what perspective one takes, it's an incredibly significant moment. It affected millions of people's lives and it created new ma majorities, which we'll come to talk about, I'm sure, but also minorities as well. And I think for that reason alone, it's, it's a really important reason to talk about this today. Thank you very much. Okay. A lot to think about. Ian McGregor. Yeah, thanks, Virgil. I'm also very grateful for the invitation to be here. Um, so the Government of Ireland Act, um, it, well, it doesn't resonate powerfully in Irish history, I'd say, or at least not in Irish national memory. And its main architect, Walter Long, isn't exactly a, a household name. Um, but it did establish the border that we still uh, live with today. Um, I'd say it was the exhaustion of attempts at compromise and accommodation between unionists and nationalists. In other words, it was a sort of stalemate rather than a, a solution to the problem. Uh, there's a, a recent study by um, a scholar named Volker Prott of um, redrawing borders in, in Europe in the years between 1917 and 1923. Um, the politics of self-determination which concludes that everybody talked about self-determination when they were redrawing borders in Czechoslovakia, for example, or Poland or Turkey. But in fact, self-determination was modified by strategic interests and by local pressures, and that's certainly the case in Ireland. Uh, the, the border, the partition of Ireland, I think was um, the most unworkable um, solution, to paraphrase Winston Churchill, the most unworkable solution that British, politics had, that British politicians had come up with, except for all the other ones. Um, two quick things about it that are interesting. I think the variations are fascinating. Um, should it be four counties, six counties or nine counties? Um, should it be temporary or permanent? Should it involve direct rule or, or devolution? Um, there's a lot of um, counterfactuals there that serious historians aren't supposed to indulge themselves in, but are quite fascinating. The other point that interests me is that it was a war of ideas. Um, we sometimes say that this was a triumph of physical force uh, over democracy, um, but it wasn't really a conflict between Democrats and anti-Democrats. Everybody in Ireland appealed to the principle of self-determination, but unionists argued that there wasn't a national self that encompassed all the inhabitants of Ireland. Um, the, the tragedy was that Carson and Craig, in putting forward that principle, um, didn't also understand that it applied equally to Ulster. Thank you very much. And notwithstanding your reservations about counterfactuals, we may go there because they are just too fascinating to leave to one side. Quiva. So I, I mean, I would echo some of what Niamh has said um, in that, so I'm drawn to two possible lenses of interpretation when it comes to thinking about the Government of Ireland Act. Because there's one way we can read it in which it's, the moment has already passed and it's the British government playing catch up, presenting a solution that might have been acceptable, that might have been workable four, five, six years earlier in the pre-war period and attempting to apply this to a completely transformed set of circumstances. Um, so we can, we can take a critical view of it that way, that it, it, it doesn't bear any relationship to political realities as they existed at the time. Alternatively, we can, what the Government of Ireland Act does is, it, is it, it settles the Ulster question for Ulster Unionists, right? It doesn't settle the Ulster question for Ulster Nationalists. And as Niamh said, it creates um, different sorts of minority communities and, and there are questions around four counties, six counties, nine counties. But it, it takes it takes the heat out of the Ulster question for Ulster Unionists. And I think then it creates a political space in which a deal can then be done with Sinn Féin six, nine months later, the, the talks begin uh, some seven months after, after the Government of Ireland Act um, was passed. So it, it then opens up a whole set of other problems which are eventually partly resolved via the Border Commission. That then stores up more problems for the future. So I think I would echo Niamh and I would agree that it both solves problems and creates another set of problems. The other thing that interests me about the Government of Ireland Act to pick up on something Ian said is how, 
how sort of disconnected it is in many ways from what was happening on the ground in Ireland. So as it's making its way through Parliament, violence in Ireland is ratcheting up enormously. There are different dynamics to the violence in different parts of Ireland and we know that violence in what became Northern Ireland is different to what happened to, to the violence in the rest of the country. Um, but you know that, that almost doesn't seem to bother or concern the architects of this act. Um, and you know there are no Irish MPs who welcome this act, no nationalist MPs. So it's almost like this weird artificial um, set of suspended reality that, that, that is surrounding this act of parliament. Um, but but I, what I'm interested in is how it, it solves a certain problem while creating another set of problems. Patricia Clavin, the international dimension. Yeah, so I, Quiva and, and Eva already mentioned a world transformed. And 1920 is the year where the transformation of the world through the First World War was settled into different uh, legal and institutional forms. So at the same time as you have uh, the, par the, the partition of Ireland, the creation of two Irelands, ultimately, you have a new international organisation in the League of Nations. You have the dissolution of three empires in Central and Eastern Europe and across North and Central Africa, the creation of mandates. So it's not just that there's a territorial settlement in one place, it's actually happening all the way across Europe, down into Africa and, and across into Asia too. So it's an incredibly important moment, foundational moment for the 20th century um, that comes out of the First World War that by 1915, 1916, people have been involved in this war, but they weren't asked to fight it. There's almost no you know, popular mandate behind this war. People are fighting for self-determination in different forms. So they imagine states and nations will be aligned and there will be some kind of new political and social contract that comes out of the war. So the Government of Ireland Act, in a way, is born also of this very big global moment. Uh, Niamh Gallagher, the path to the Government of Ireland Act I mean, it has many stations reaching back deep into the 19th century, but you, I suppose we could say its most immediate beginning is with the Home Rule Crisis of, of 1912. Talk us through what was being proposed then and why, and how it leads us to the Government of Ireland Act. So I'd probably put my starting point slightly earlier than that. Um, I mean, the home, home Rule Crisis really is a crisis that starts in the 1880s. Um, there are three Home Rule Bills put forward, 1886, 1893, then 1912 through to 14. Of course, that last one is the most sort of um, politically charged one that uh, really brings the question of Ulster to the fore. So I think that really is the, that's a significant moment of that particular Home Rule Bill. The question of Ulster and what to do about Ulster in a self-governing Ireland is the issue that puts Ulster on the political agenda, on the legal agenda, uh, in the minds of ministers who are thinking about solutions, about what to do with the problem. And there were many, many solutions put forward at that time. It wasn't just the exclusion of what ended up being the six counties. I'm sure we'll come to talk about that. But there are a range of interesting solutions put forward. Tell us about some of them. Sure, OK. Um, from some federaliz federalism, for example. So Winston Churchill was a very early proponent of thinking about, uh, in a way, early devolution, what happened in the 1990s. Parliaments for Scotland, for Wales, England posed a problem. So he was suggesting uh, a variety of legislative authorities, effectively, for York, for Lancashire, you know, for many different parts of the country. Um, it went down a bit like a lead balloon, but this is part of the thinking about how can we solve the Irish question? How can we take the heat out of the Irish question? How can we make it more palatable to particularly conservatives at that time? So that's just one of the solutions put forward, but there were indeed quite a few. Ian, why is the notion of home rule so objectionable to Ulster Protestants at that point? Okay, um, well, one answer to that that's sometimes suggested by historians is that Ulster Protestants were motivated by a kind of racial supremacism, that they just thought the rest of the Irish population was inferior and um, that this was handing over the industrious, um, intelligent section of the Irish population to um, as um, Joseph Chamberlain put it in the 1880s, the failures. Um, and there is, a, there is some evidence for that at the time. Um, you know, there's a, a journalist, Sidney Brooke, who writes a, a piece on Ulster for the North American Review, who says, you know, Belfast is like Chicago. You know, it's a huge success story. But then he says um, the Ulster Protestants are like Texan planters and um, telling them that they're going to be governed by Southern Catholics is like telling the Texan planters they're going to be governed by Negroes. 
the term that he used. And this, it, they're, you know, they will be brought down a level in human civilization. Um, that's obviously not a very satisfying answer because the opposition to home rule encompassed um, all classes among the Protestant population in the North, um, both Episcopalian and Presbyterian denominations and the other smaller denominations. It included the liberal um, element of Ulster uh, Unionist opinion who distanced themselves very clearly uh, from the Tories. And so I, I think you have to take their objections a bit more seriously. And they were um, uh, religion, um, always the most common one, and that is that their rights would not be treated um, uh, fairly or equally in a home rule Ireland. E economics, that they were producing so much of the wealth of Ireland and their economy would suffer, and Ulster was the great success story of the 19th century. And then, to a lesser extent, I think that the empire would be endangered by home rule. And those um, objections were taken seriously in, in Britain. I mean, it wasn't as if people at, at that time thought the Ulster Unionists were all mad. You know, people thought they're, they're all worth considering. But in the end, it's about political relationships. The answer to the Ulster Unionists was, it'll be okay, either because you will have plenty of representatives in the new Dublin Parliament. In fact, you might even be dominating the new Dublin Parliament. Once you're involved in governing Ireland, you and your nationalist brothers um, will work in harmony. Um, and the trouble was that um, there was no guarantee that that would happen. It was, um, you know, they were just told, don't worry, it will work out. It'll be all right in the night. And I think when you're told that, you probably know that you're being shafted somehow. And you've got to ask yourself, you know, well, how did it work out for nationalists in Northern Ireland? Um, not very well. And when Carson says, I say this to my nationalist fellow countrymen, and indeed also to the government, you have never tried to win over Ulster. You have never tried to understand her position. Was there justice in that? I, I think there was quite a lot of justice in that because um, the leaders of the Home Rule Party showed very little interest in, in Ulster Unionist arguments uh, and dealing with them um, closely or in detail. Um, I think really the, the hope was that um, Ulster Unionist resistance would melt away, that it wasn't really based on anything serious, um, and that if Carson did set up his provisional government in the North, that it couldn't possibly survive. So um, I don't think there was a very serious attempt to win them over. Because you, you see this over and again in, in Irish nationalism. Go back to O'Connell through Parnell, a failure to grasp the grit and determination uh, of, of unionists. Quiva, do you, do you see in the sense of advanced nationalists in this period any sense of reality about, about what their northern sort of fellow countrymen are, are capable of doing? No, um, and it's it's quite a, it's extra it's quite interesting that they cling to they, there's a kind of a burying their head in their sand when it comes to the reality of what they're facing uh, in Ulster, uh, with with the with the ferocity and the seriousness of, of Ulster Unionist opposition to Home Rule in the first instance, and one would think that once the Republic has been declared and Sinn Fein are, have withdrawn and set up Dáil Éireann, that there would be some kind of recognition that we're going to have to sort this out at some point. You know, if, if home rule is unacceptable to Ulster Unionists, an Irish Republic is probably going to be even more unacceptable. Um, but there's, you know, there, there are some conflicting statements, I think, made by leaders of Sinn Féin. So at, at various points in 1919, De Valera, Im De Valera says, you know, no, but nobody wants to see any Irishman coerced into anything he doesn't want, either nationalist or unionist. But a few months later, he's adamant that, you know, Ireland must not be partitioned, that it would be a 32 county republic. So I think, um, I think there's a kind of failure to face political realities that is endemic in Irish nationalism broadly, both constitutional and and advanced nationalists. And by the time the constitutional nationalists in the form of the Irish Parliamentary Party accept the political realities that are staring them in the face in 1917 with the Irish Convention and suggest a deal that might be struck to satisfy opinion on both sides in conjunction with Southern Unionists, by, the, by that time both Ulster Unionists and advanced nationalists are, are already down the road far ahead of them. So 
it's quite interesting. And, and you know, there's no real excuse for Sinn Féin to be ignoring the political reality at the time. They were contesting elections in, I mean, we might come on to these 1921 elections. They contested those elections in what became the, the, the Northern Ireland Parliament. They're standing alongside nationalists and alongside Ulster Unionists. Um, but yet they don't seem willing to face the reality that that, that, is, that is the situation they're dealing with. Niamh Gallagher. Um, yeah, just to add to that as well, I think you know, the, the other dimension of this is thinking about what's happening in the British government at that time. And there's no single view about what to do about Ulster either. Um, and even among ministers, um, part of the reason I mentioned Churchill again is I've, I'm doing a slight mini side project on him. Um, however, he becomes an early advocate for the idea of Ulster's exclusion. And um, he thinks that Ulster, he ultimately hopes that Ulster will rejoin the rest of Ireland uh, on the basis of its own consent, on the consent principle. Something we're very familiar with when you think about the Good Friday Agreement, for instance. Um, but this really isn't taken seriously until very late in the day. So even amongst ministers within, within Westminster at the time, within the cabinet, within the government, within parliament, of course, you have a variety of views and there's no single view about what to do. Patricia, I'm just wondering, this is not unique to the island of Ireland in the period. This idea that your self-determination is something absolute, that it's, it, it doesn't take into account the aspirations of other minorities or indeed a majority. Right, and I wonder whether actually following up Kiva's point about the nationalists not really recognising that they were going to have to deal with the unionists' position over a longer period also lies in the fact that nationalists aren't just looking to, to Britain, to the United Kingdom, to solve the problem. They're also going to Geneva, where a new body of international law is being created, where treaties are being drafted with a number of states that embody minority rights. And they actually, at certain points, certainly de Valera, looks to the League of Nations and asks the League to intervene and to impose the kind of deal that countries like Poland are getting. Um, but the difficulty is that what the nationalists don't appreciate is that this new international system, uh, with the, especially with the Americans stepping out of it in 1919, by the end of it, it's the British that dominate the, the new body of international law. So actually, the British are um, sort of settling up in different ways in Central and Eastern Europe to the way they are at home. And an international solution is not going to be imposed on Ireland in the way that some of the nationalists hope. And actually at the same time, aside from uh, minority treaties and self-determination being overseen by the League of Nations, which actually stipulates and forces quite strongly the right of sovereign states in its system, you also have the Catholic Church also getting involved in self-determination and using, it redrafts uh, canon law, which sort of privileges the creation of nation states. So I think there's also a hope there that there'll be another different type of international intercession on Ireland's behalf. So I think though it looks like it's just a British Irish thing, it's not, it's on being played on a much larger international stage. Quiva, to what degree does the militarization of the island from 1912 onwards make any kind of realistic compromise between unionist and nationalist impossible. Because let's not forget we had a, you know, a Tory leader, mm. Boner Law, speaking mm. in, you could describe seditious terms and, uh, about what he was prepared to do and prepared to back on the island of Ireland. So the atmosphere has changed and has, in, you know, one could use the word, infected constitutional politics. Mm. I mean, it's... One of these amendments that popped into my mind when you were asking Neve earlier to talk about, you know, the, the gestation of the Home Rule Bill was the was the Agar Roberts Amendment, which was the amendment to the third Home Rule Bill that proposed Ulster exclusion. Now, this all revolved around whether it would be temporary or permanent exclusion. Um, and, and it was rejected. It, it was initially intended to be temporary and was rejected by Carson because he viewed it as a, a sentence of execution with a stay of seven years. Um, and one of the, I'll come on to your militarisation point, I just kind of want to f float around it a Fine. little bit for a minute. Uh, one of the, of course, one of the great ironies with the Government of Ireland Act is that it brings into being um, a, a, political, a, a political institution in Ulster that Ulster Unionists armed themselves to try and defeat some 
some six years previously in the form of um, you know, home rule. So they accept home rule in 1920 when they, you know, they set up a, a provisional government and ran in arms to, to, to push back against home rule in, in 1912, 13 and 14. Um, I do think that once you have it's a great problem. Once you start creating paramilitary armies, what are you going to do with them? And temperatures start ratcheting up. Once you start running in guns, even if the guns that you run in are useless or, or not so great as they were in Hoth, um, you know, you're, you're raising expectations. Um, for me, it's not so much the militarization pre-1912 as it is the militarization post-1916 and the impact of the conscription crisis. I think that just sets advanced nationalism on a completely different path and a different course. I think there might have been I think there might have been still a window of opportunity had Sinn Féin not completely outpaced the Irish Parliamentary Party. Um, but you know, once you start having private armies, you need to do something with those private armies, otherwise they run away with themselves. And I suppose at the same time, Kiva, when you think about the militarisation of politics in Central and Eastern Europe, you have Freikorps yeah. troops running around there. And actually, you know, historians now calculate that in the aftermath of the First World War, you have 4.5 million extra dead as a result of ethnic conflict, including in Ireland, all the way across Europe. So we always imagine that peace comes with the armistice at the end of 1918 and that it's a sort of settled, bit, slightly bumpy process. But many of us now would say, peace doesn't really come until 1923 and that's not just in the We're case going to of, come to that in yeah the but it just yeah. you know that the, the way that violence is being played out and the way that society and people are shaped by the experience of the great war i think is much more evident to us now than it would have been historically Neve and then Ian. yeah so just back to the your, your point about militarization and sort of pre-world war one militarization um some of the interesting things to, to think about here um, would be the mobilisation of, first of all, Ulster Volunteers as part of the Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF. And that's important, I think, from a sort of, if we're examining the kind of shifting landscape of identities in Ulster, um, you know, this gives an Ulster designation to a militarised force. That's quite important. That gets brought into the First World War itself under the name of the 36th Ulster Division. So in a way, you kind of have sort of entities being created around this notion of Ulster even if it isn't itself defined by, by county numbers, by arithmetic at that point in time. So that's an interesting, I think, point just when we're thinking about sort of evolution of Ulster identities. We might also think about how um, it actually didn't polarise in some ways. So let's think about um, Owen McNeill, who's a formative figure at the time, and he writes a very important piece called The North Began. And he sees this as a fantastic moment, the militarisation of the UVF. He wants the Irish nationalists, who later on mobilises the Irish volunteers, to join them and to have basically an all-Ireland army, in a way, combined of the volunteers from both camps, who can defend Ireland if the Germans are to invade in August 1914. And it electrifies advanced nationalists as well, doesn't it? And it electrifies advanced nationalists, exactly, and it's in a really important moment for thinking about that evolution of advanced nationalism uh, into the Easter Rising. Ian. Yeah, your question makes me think about what the, the Austrians were really up to. And I, I don't think it's very easy to come up with an answer to that. Uh, and obviously people at the time um, often said, this is just bluff, it'll all collapse. I mean, you've got uh, maybe 90,000 Ulster volunteers. Um, they've, they've got um, 25,000 weapons, um, even though they might not all, all know how to use them. Then behind that, there's the Covenant, um, it's almost half a million people signed the covenant uh, in 1912 um, to take, you know, to oppose home rule by any means necessary. So it's understood that they're backing Carson's plan for a, a loyalist rebellion, as it were. Um, and um, that's a lot of people. It's a higher turnout than the last US election or the referendum on the UK leaving the EU. It's, it's about 70, 77% of men, 72% of women, adult Protestant men and women. Um, and um, I think Carson's view was that, I think the calculation was the British government will never um, open fire on the loyal sons of Ulster in the streets of Belfast. It wasn't so much that you could imagine using the UVF to um, you know, take over arms depots in the north, um, but that British public opinion wouldn't stand for loyalists being shot down in order to impose home rule on, on Ireland. And Asquith's view uh, um, at the time was to, you know, to, to do, not to do very much about it, because it, it'll probably run into some kind of trouble 
um, you know, that they lose control adjust. of it. <laughs> well, it did, but they, they thought, you know, well, there'll be some riots in Belfast yeah. and then we can use the troops to restore order. Or the banks um, in Belfast will panic if the provisional government takes over. So there was an argument for doing nothing, except as Neve says, there are knock-on effects. And once the Ulster volunteers get arms, then the Irish volunteers want arms too. We need to come back to the act itself, and I think it's worthwhile at this point in the discussion spelling out exactly what it involved, if you wouldn't mind talking us through it now. Yeah, um, so I mean the Government of Ireland Act passed or receives the Royal Assent in December 1920. I think it has a variety of different elements beforehand, but um, the main sort of architecture of it is the creation of effectively two home rule parliaments for the island of Ireland. And just a note on that first of all, there's an irony in this. The irony in this is that for 30 odd years, uh, a bit more, you had a protest with, across both islands in fact, I mean we often think of unionism as just being within the island of Ireland or within Ulster, the British Conservative Party remobilised and called themselves the Conservative and Unionist Party to support the unionist movement. So anyway, um, as an aside, they are you know, the opposition that's against home rule is as ironic because in the end that's what Ulster gets. Ulster gets a Home Rule Parliament for itself. And that's the, the irony of this act in a way. Um, but you also have a Home Rule Parliament created for the South, but I think as Kivas mentioned, the sort of pace and momentum of politics has outstripped that solution for um, what becomes the free state. Um, so yeah, that's the first bit. And we might also think about the Council of Ireland as well, which is meant to be a joint legislative thing. Yeah. Because, might that have had in it the germ of something much greater with a different kind of political atmosphere if we hadn't seen the kind of eruption of militarism um, and the advance into the war of independence and then civil war. Do you mean the Council of Ireland? Yes, well? yeah. Well, I mean, the Council of Ireland would probably, in order to work, would rely on, would have to rely on participation and consent. On both sides, yeah. Uh, on both sides, and I don't think that was there. Um, and I think James Craig had particularly um, a tough time from his own backbenchers mm -hmm. about whether or not this should be something that should be considered. And he wasn't a fan of it himself. And that was why there were sort of discussions between him and Michael Collins at the time about how to even get past this Council of Ireland problem. Um, but I don't think we should completely say it's redundant. It appear, appears in different sort of guises. Sunningdale and Sunningdale, now. exactly, yeah. right through the 20th century, yeah. yeah. Um, Patricia, all of this happens in the shadow of you know, much larger negotiations that are taking place in Paris and we can see yeah. the drawing of lines in the Middle East, uh, in, in the wreckage of the Ottoman Empire but also the Habsburg world. It, can we see Ireland as part of a much larger struggle to establish a post-imperial reality? Certainly, and, and the Irish saw themselves as part of that. I mean, one of the things that's very interesting about Irish nationalists is the way in which their struggle is watched by other nationalist groups in, 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 in Egypt who are resisting the man, imposition of the mandate, in Iraq, uh, in Transjordan and Palestine where there is a mandate. They're all watching and looking at one another's sort of movements and positioning. You have debates inside um, the League of Nations and people appealing to the League of Nations and offering different sorts of solutions also in the Irish case. So there's a proposition that Ireland should be placed under mandat mandatory rule. So that would in a way internationalise the problem because it would scrutinise British governance of the mandate. Uh, and that's what the British found. So the mandates look like in this moment of 1920 for the British Empire when it then reaches its biggest extent because it gets the mandates in North Africa. Um, it looks larger, but what they find over time is that it means that they're, what they're doing there is open to international scrutiny in a way that it wasn't before. Uh, and Germany becomes the great champion, as it has been already, as you both pointed out, in the 19th century, of a minority group. So the Germans use their mandatory oversight of um, Britain's role in Palestine or Iraq as a way of shaming the British Empire and criticising their treatment of the minority. So that's one possible solution that the League would go near and the British government would not have tolerated for Ireland. A second proposal is that um, that the Irish issue and the, and the, and the sort of development of, of what should be done in 1919, 1920 be put before the International Court in The Hague and be subject to scrutiny from judges from friendly neutral states, small states that are kind of can understand the problem, so Switzerland, the Netherlands or Sweden and Norway because they had a famously 
peaceful separation in, in 1905. And then there's also this event, you know, this intercession to actually allow Ireland to be properly separated in the way that the Czechs had managed it in 1918. So all of this is being played in a very formal way out, outside of Ireland too. May I ask, I mean, do you think that this the, the, the desire of the British to avoid getting sucked into those sorts of debates, I've been wondering if, if that's what explains the speed with which the British government returned to this Government of Ireland Act and get it through Parliament because it kind of settles the problem and it, and it covers up a weakness that they may, may have when it comes to international opinion and they can say yes we did have a problem but we've solved it and we have we have created we have allowed self-determination for all of our for both those problem parts absolutely it's really fundamental and i think that that's where the timing of 1920 you know and is really critical because this is the year where at the end of 1919 it becomes clear the Americans are not going to be there to underpin this. So the British on the one hand are and look more powerful than they've ever been because the extent of the empire is enormous, they've won the First World War, they are you know a supreme in, as a naval power, they've got this trading empire which is still next to none because the Americans don't really export very much but they're also massively indebted to the United States and they now have inherited the League of Nations, which has all of these new nation states in it. And they've got a body of multilateral international law that they've helped draft and they now have to oversee. So the Government of Ireland Act is actually understood internationally in that context. So I think you're absolutely right. And it's one of the ways that we sometimes forget about the way these problems play out, that we imagine in a, in a sort of challenge of creating nation states, it then produces a national history and a nationalizing problem, mm. if that makes sense. But actually what you've got is a really big international and transnational context uh, that everybody at the time understands that. And we then lose sight of it subsequently. Mm. It brings to mind when Henry Wilson says at some point during the, the, the War of Independence, if we lose Ireland, we lose the empire. Was he overstating the case in terms of the contemporary fears? I don't think so. I mean, I think that certainly what was happening in Ireland was being very closely watched in India, and there are lots of con connections between Irish nationalists and Indian nationalists from the 19th century and thereafter. I think it's also that Ireland quite quickly, you know, after 1920, by 1923 with the Free Strait, then joins the League of Nations as an independent member, as a fully recognised nation state, inside that international organisation, which is obviously the predecessor to the United Nations, it's critical for your international recognition as a nation state. Then India inhabits this very strange space inside the League of Nations, because it is recognised as a sovereign authority there, even though it's definitely not independent. The Dominions are in the same status. So, and actually Irish uh, citizens are very, very present in Geneva in all sorts of ways. Irish women as peace activists. Uh, Sean Lester becomes um, Secretary General of the League of Nations by the Second World War and goes to Danzig as a High Commissioner overseeing the treatment of German minorities inside Poland. So this is a really kind of sort of longer term projection of Ireland internationally as well. And what brings me back to my earlier point about how nationalists view unions on the island of Ireland, where we're very preoccupied with internationalising uh, the issue. On the island itself, we're doing far less well in terms of recognising, you know, moving to the period of the Government of Ireland Act, what unionists are about. Niamh, tell me what's happening in terms of negotiations between figures like de Valera, Collins and Craig and others uh, in the north of Ireland. How are they responding, Irish nationalists, to the reality of the Government of Ireland Act? Um, I think that's, that's not a, it's not an easy question to answer um, because there are very different views about the Act. So when we look at, um, let's say, some contemporary newspapers, the Belfast Newsletter, for example, we can certainly see among unionists that this is an act that's being passed, it's being acknowledged, it's an important moment, um, and you have a lot of popular support, understandably, for it. At the same time, if you look at newspapers, say like the Irish Independent or um, the Freeman's Journal or any of the sort of provincial newspapers of which there were several, you have engagement with this, but also not real engagement with this. Um, in those newspapers, they talk about the Partition Bill, the Partition Act, um, but at the same time, you know, they 
uh, the sort of when the idea of the boundary commission comes about, it's believed that that will actually diminish this Government of Ireland Act and it'll solve the problem and it'll redistribute territory. Um, and therefore, it's not seen, as I was saying at the beginning, as an end point to any of this. It's part of a journey. Because partition, the Government of Ireland Act, is not what causes the Irish Civil War. No. It's the oath of allegiance and the, the failure to deliver a republic. Why is, why is that, do you think? Why did it not matter as much as, you know, what seems from this distant, a relatively minor issue like taking an oath to the king to get through? Well, I think so. The, the, we haven't talked a lot about what's been going on in the, in the meantime. So there's the committee rooms in Westminster um, where um, Walter Long uh, is trying to reconcile home rule with Ulster resistance. And meanwhile in Ireland, home rule is dying. So, you know, there's a 1918 election, Sinn Féin landslide, the establishment of the Dáil, a you know, revolutionary um, government and um, parliament in waiting, um, a volunteer army which is sort of being colonised uh, by Michael Collins and the IRB, and at the same time from the bottom up by people who want to fight. Um, all of that's going on in Ireland and, and means that the, the, you know, the southern component of this solution um, no longer applies at all. And it's fueled by a kind of nationalism, um, Sinn Féin um, nationalism, which is separatist and Gaelicist and is the least likely kind of Irish nationalism so far to compromise with membership of, of the empire. Um, so that raises the question of um, whether, if the treaty is supported, whether the Irish will, for the first time in their history, consent to their own subordination within the British Empire. So de Valera's point um, had always been to show, you know, there was Ireland was an independent state for a thousand years before the Normans came. And then you had to show very carefully that it had rebelled in each generation, that it never consented to being part of a British governed unit. And the problem with the treaty was um, its opponents thought that for the first time we're going to agree, you know, we're, we're going to give in to the British Empire. And I, the Ulster problem was just less immediate. Um, and of course, um, in the north, Craig was already starting to arm the Unionists to, to defend the six counties. Um, so um, it was a hypothetical issue um, in the south, I think. It's extraordinary when you consider all the bother <laughs> that, has, that has emanated from it. I, I think Neve is right that there, during the treaty negotiations and during the treaty um, debates, there's, there's a belief that, OK, this problem with that was created with the Government of Ireland Act, we'll sort that out when, it come, when the Boundary Commission gives us back all our territory and Northern Ireland will be reduced to four counties. It'll be unsustainable as, as, a, as a political entity and they'll be forced to come in. I think that's, that's the, the logic. And, you know, certainly there are members in the, of the Northern Nationalist community and the Northern Republican community, the Northern IRA, who are very concerned by the treaty or, or by, by partition or by the treaty because it copper fastens partition. So nobody wants to face the reality that partition has already become a political reality in July 1921 when the or in June 1921 when the Northern Parliament opens but by December 1921 they're anxious that the treaty copper fastens partition. Now what's interesting to me about the civil war is not so much that the civil war isn't about the north it's not about partition but that there's a moment where it seems that the north might form a way out of one type of civil war but by opening up another civil war Collins so is northern exactly offensive. exactly so that you can reunite these divided wings of the republican movement who are divided as ian said over the degree of of the degree to which irish republicanism will have to compromise with the empire and they can unite to fight their common enemy but the problem is union or not, nor irish nationalism and irish republicanism never wants to admit that the common enemy is ulster unionists they want to, they need to pretend or they need to insist that the common enemy is Britain and it's and it's always because they're looking to London to sort to sort out the problems in Ireland and not necessarily within Ireland itself and that's why you know you don't have many negotiations between northern leaders uh, Carson and Craig and uh, and southern leaders Collins and Cosgrave these are very few and far between and indeed after the second um, 
pact, uh, Craig Collins pact, northern and southern leaders don't meet for another 40 years, I think it's not until Lamas and O'Neill meet in person. 40 years of a complete cold, cold war. Patricia. Yeah, I just wanted to add, because the timing is so, is so, um, uh, congruent with what's happening in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Of course, you've got treaties that are being drafted and then they're being redrafted in the wake of, of violence. So particularly if you think about what happens between Lithuania and Poland and so on. Do you think there's a sense in which actually there's a determination to kind of copper plate the deal that they have because they can see new territories and new treaties being drafted right the way across Europe, you know, between 90, what is it, 1919 and 1923. The Treaty of Lausanne sort of marks the end of that, but it's a very contingent, dynamic mm. setting. On the part of who, desire on the part on of the, who? On, on the part of the Irish. I think they don't, they have no, cons they have no um, sense, they do not suspect in any context that they would lose territory when the Boundary Commission right. um, oh, right. produces its final report. Mm. And when the report is leaked, um, and it turns out that there would be sub some sections of what was the Free State returned to Northern Ireland, then the whole thing is a disaster and has to be shelved. So, so in actual fact, the, you know, the, bo the boundary is never redrawn. They just stick with those original boundaries that were drawn, which are the county boundaries from, from when, whenever the administrative system took place. So I think they, 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 don't, they do not um, have any suspicion that, that the Boundary Commission would find against them. Um, and that's why they don't... I feel like they don't really engage with the Boundary Commission all that, all that well. I mean, I know this is something Joe Lee wrote about a few, 30 years ago, um, that Owen McNeill, who Neil mentioned earlier, is the Irish nominee on this Boundary Commission, and he's kind of set up as a fall guy because he's an unpopular you know, member of the Cabinet anyway, um, and he, he's the sort of the patsy for the disaster that was always going to be the Boundary Commission. And so we, in the South, confine ourselves to rhetorical eruptions um, at strategic periods, but nothing much more than that. No, but that, I mean, the Boundary Commission does go back to your counterfactuals. Um, you know, uh, um, uh, Richard Feedham, the South African judge who oversees the thing, is told he has to take into consideration the wishes of the local inhabitants in redrawing the boundary and economic and geographical factors. <clears throat> and he seems to um, interpret economical and geographical factors as meaning upholding the existence of a separate Belfast Parliament. Um, and actually, in order to do that, uh, you know, you need to keep the six counties largely as they are. So, um, you know, Derry, on Derry, for example, there's a, a Catholic nationalist majority. Geographically, you could say it's part of Donegal, um, but um, Freedom decides it must stay in the six counties. Newry, similarly, um, there's a Catholic majority, nationalist majority, and the surrounding area. Um, but again, it's, um, Freedom decides it's got to stay in Northern Ireland for economic and geographical reasons. Um, and it's interesting to know what exactly would have happened if you could have just, if, if um, nationalists had focused on Derry or Newry or on Fermanagh and Tyrone and said, OK, um, you've got an argument for a separate administration, but not for nationalist majority areas. So that was always the weak point of the unionist argument right from 1912 onwards. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so maybe it's worthwhile just saying a bit about um, how the Boundary Commission was, was done in a way. And what happened to it. And what happened to it, yeah. yeah. Well, um, yeah. so it was, you know, it was set up and it was postponed because of the, the civil war in Ireland. So it only really started in, I think it was November 1924, but I might get the month wrong. Um, and anyway, it was sort of an interesting process, as Ian mentioned, whereby a tiny committee of people Ulster sent, or should I say, the Unionist government in Ulster sent no representative because they did not want to be associated with any change of territory, right? So actually it was, a, I think, a former editor for the, um, the Northern Whig, the newspaper, yeah, who was appointed to the, to the committee alongside Owen McNeill. Um, and I think there was one more as well. Anyway, they conducted a range of interviews with about um, 150 people who lived on the border. And they did this by advertising in local papers and saying, can, can we get some volunteers to come and talk to us about this? And, you know, all, all of the respondents are men, one. Um, they're all men who are, let's say, men of influence. So they tend to be middle-class men. So they're farmers or they're merchants or whatever they may be. 
and uh, there's a range of different interviews that the committee has with these 150 volunteers and uh, they're all available online actually if you wanted to go and read them they're quite extensive um, but yes you get lots of sorts of um, complaints that are voiced and you get a real insight into what life was like for border communities at that time um, of course as Kiva said the, the actual boundary commission changes never came to pass. They were leaked in uh, 1925 and um, when it became realised that actually there was going to be no considerable transfer of territory, there was quite an effort to in a way hush it up and to just like move on um, and there were other incentives coupled with that such as a reduction in the war debt payments that you mentioned earlier on Patricia and things like this. So it's a sort of a temporary moment but an interesting counterfactual about what might have happened. Mm. Even I'm from the sort of the Newry territory and when I look back where I live uh, and I, I grew up in Northern Ireland um, I would have grown up in what would have become the Free State had the Boundary Commission results um, come out and unchanged. You too Ian. Oh, there you go. There you are. Well, <laughs> my people were uh, active in Kerry in that period, as it were, and I have to say I never heard them mention Northern Ireland. It just did not factor in the kind of discussions long after the war, but when they, when they looked at what they were fighting for, I had very much the sense it was the ground beneath their feet. It was not to do with a, an All-Ireland Republic. Um, Quiva, can I just turn to you and ask, was there a sense that the 26 counties were so exhausted from the cost of civil war, physical and uh, uh, emotional cost, that the idea of embarking on some new uh, campaign of territorial redemption, mm. it simply wasn't an option, mm. even, if, even if there had been a strong public desire. Mm. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's fair enough. And I think there's also a project of state building and the kind of state that they are hoping to build, that they go ahead to build, as Ian said, is, is, is a Gaelic state, is, you know, is an intensely Catholic state, although you know, not, not officially so, at least in terms of the early free state, the Catholic Church does have an official position or a special position in the, um, in the 1937 constitution. Um, so you know, there are two parallel projects of state building that, that occur after partition on the island of Ireland. Um, there's state building uh, in, in Northern Ireland, the state building in the Irish Free State. There's also a sort of parallel, maybe shadow state that's kind of being built or being forged by Northern nationalists who, are, who have to find a way of, of sort of, co of existing within this, uh, within this Northern Ireland that they didn't want to be part of, but they have to, they have to live there. They have to, you know, although they can, you know, there are some moments where, you know, some uh, county councils along the border initially um, pledged their allegiance to, to the Dublin government and, and, and said they're not going to send rates to, to the Stormont Parliament, but that, that quickly gets stamped out pretty robustly by, by, by the Craig government. So, so you know, the, the two states that are being forged in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, it probably suits everybody to just engage in a bit of sabre rattling from time to time, um, to have these, you know, claims to territorial integrity that eventually get put into um, Articles 2 and 3 of the Constitution. But you know, I think the question of Northern Ireland is, is a sort of a cross in the South. It's a kind of a cross party question that everyone has the same ultimate line on that. Let's we, we make some Republican noises, but we don't want to ever pretend that we're going to send an army up to invade or anything like that. It's just not part of the economic or political realities. So on the question of um, nationalists fighting for the North, um, that, that raises the question of violence in Belfast and, and elsewhere in this period. And by European standards, the violence is low. Um, it, it's low in numbers and it's um, less gruesome uh, than on the European mainland. But the violence in Belfast peaks in, in relation with events on the border and in the south. So it's bad in the summer of 1920. And, and it's related, I mean, it's immediately triggered by attacks on Protestants in the Reduction South. of loyalists as well. And then again, in 1922, in that period, um, just before the outbreak of the Civil War, when there, there are kidnappings and so on on the border, the dynamic seems to be um, that you attack Protestants on the border, and then in Belfast, the Catholics get the sharp end of, of the reaction. And it's that point when you get the McMahon killings, the killings of, of six um, Catholic men in Belfast, um, the, the, uh, the killing of six children in a bomb attack, 
um, the Alt Neve um, killings on the border near near Newry, um, the killings of six um, Protestants, and this is all in April May 1922. Uh, and I think Ernest Blythe, for example, realises that if you press um, the Northern Protestants, this is what happens. So he is saying just before the outbreak of the Civil War, the people who are going to suffer most are the, the Catholic minority in Belfast. Patricia, this is a period in which hundreds of thousands of people are being moved in Europe and I'm thinking particularly the formation of a new Turkey, what happens to the Armenian right. Greek populations, the Smyrna and the massacres there, but the Balkans as well. And I wonder if, if I could ask you to just reflect on the degree to which events of that kind, which took place in the 20s, motivate politics for decades to come and right into the present day. As much as we see what happened in 1920, uh, 1922, mm. profoundly affecting the relationships on the island of Ireland today. Mm. Yes, I mean it's a it's a legacy that you know what self determination brings after uh, 1980. I was once in a seminar where someone said self determination isn't a principle; it's a disease, and it's because the 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 expectations that people are promised through self-determination, through the, the delivery of statehood, are so great. And you also have that they're hung on, on an ethno-nationalist identity. It's not about empowering people separate to their ethnic identity. And, and in, in, in the parts of, 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 well, Eurasia that you've talked about, the casualties are enormous and some of the solutions are incredibly drastic. You know, forcible movements of populations, separations, there were pogroms happening in this period. Um, the Jewish population suffers enormously around the same time in the borderlands, you know, the frontiers where this, this unmixing is happening. And it does have a profound uh, legacy right up until the 21st century, I mean, and particularly in Central and Eastern Europe and in North Africa, where you have these sort of, you know, straight lines on a map uh, that don't fit at all to where people, uh, or where they live and how they live and who they are. Why is the Government of Ireland Act so little remembered beyond uh, sort of his historians and experts? Niamh. Um So I'll, I'll answer that now, but I'd love to say a bit more about minorities actually as well. Answer that um, first and then come to minorities. Okay, okay. we'll come back to minorities. Yeah. So why is it so little remembered? You could say it's so little remembered because in fact most of it doesn't exist anymore. It was repealed. For, for instance, in 1998, it's now under the Northern Ireland Act as part of the Good Friday Agreement remit. So in one sense, it doesn't exist. In another sense, you might say it's n not remembered because let's even say for, um, let's talk about unionists in, in Northern Ireland. For them, their identity never was the Government of Ireland Act as such. They call themselves unionists. And that is a sort of an identity based on the 1801 Act of Union. So in some ways, the kind of lack of, I suppose, protest about repealing that in, after the Good Friday Agreement in a way is because the, the imagined identity is still very much tied to an earlier form of legislation, which was the 1801 Act. The thing is, you know, what sticks in the popular memory is popular mobilisation um, and not legislation. So, um, I mean, the Unionists um, uh, remembered the Solemn League and Covenant of 1912, the raising of the UVF, and in many ways that left them very badly e equipped when they took over Northern Ireland. Uh, so when the, the Belfast Parliament opens in June 1921, there are crowds um, celebrating its opening, waving banners that say, we will not have home rule. And the irony is, of course, home rule is exactly what they've got in 1921. So, um, you know, it's Carson's statue that is outside uh, Stormont. Um, that is the heroic figure who resists Irish nationalism, resists home rule. It's not Craig. Um, who actually, um, you know, builds the Northern Irish state. So that kind of stuff involves, you know, um, messy um, administrative work. And the same is true on, on the nationalist side. Um, it tends to be, well, of course, it's the Easter Rising that's uh, commemorated most of all. Yeah, I mean, I think, just speak about uh, why it's not remembered down south, it's just, I think it has no... It has no political currency down south. So, you know, the institutions, the representative institution to which the state kind of looks back and dates its foundation from is, is on the 21st of January 1919. Um, the, the elections that, that occur, well, the kind of false elections that occur 
in the summer of 1921, uh, you know, ostensibly under the auspices of the Government of Ireland Act, they're to the second Doyle. So there's a, you know, they're, they're dating, they're, they're looking back to the Doyle as the, as the locus of, of, of political sovereignty. The Government of Ireland Act is, is a political irrelevance for nationalists. And, and you know, once the Doyle, then, then you have debates around the third Doyle and, and the Irish Free State. But I just think that the Government of Ireland Act doesn't carry any real political currency in nationalist imagination itself because they, they're too busy trying to ignore it the whole time. When you look at the, the, the legacy um, and, you know, as somebody who's reported in, in, in these places of lines drawn on imperial maps in places like Bosnia and places like Turkey, uh, and the degree to which memory is still profoundly weaponised, can we argue that, in, in fact, this period of centenaries that we're witnessing here has actually been pretty mature on the whole, in the terms of the, of the way we've remembered and what we've chosen to remember? I think so. I mean, I think what's been striking about it is actually thinking about that certainly the First World War leading to the centenary of, of you know, the, glo the new global order of 1920. We got through the First World War very quickly, so what we remembered is the, is the mass mobilisation, the death, the sacrifice. And the, and the claims to sovereignty and the, the, the quest also for a, for a fairer social and economic order that was also very strongly there. I mean, we haven't really talked about the communist revolution or the treaties of Brest-Litovsk, but all of that's also all around statehood and, 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 and people's rights. So I think, I think in that sense, the, centenary's been, the centenaries have been really important and a, and a more mature reflection than we would have seen probably 30 years ago. Certainly earlier than that, yeah. I mean, the, the, the revolutions, if we can call them, uh, if, we, we, if we take it there wasn't just one revolution on the island of Ireland in this period, they're, they're not really about social change in the manner that you describe in that European sense. No, I, I, mean, I, I mean, you're the expert in identity. this. Well, Niamh. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, women are kind of yeah. the, the real fall mm -hmm. group for yeah. this entire revolution and you know we think about um the sort of the new makeup of what becomes the free state even though the the church the catholic church isn't as, as kiva said part of the constitution still there's an incredibly close relationship between the church and the state mm. and women become almost testament to the sort of veracity of the state there's a concern about morality and about policing morality and um, uh, a concern that women will be corrupted from english influences and so there's lots of efforts to make women um, recast as mothers. That is their formative role. They give birth to children, that's it. You have a number of policies that are brought in, like the marriage bar, things like this, which says if a, if a woman is married, she gives up her job. She goes back to the home and she works. So, you know, she works in the home because the family is the center of where the, the national unit coheres. So, so really there's, you know, a kind of, um, a, a, an incredible disappointment, I think, for many female radicals who were talking about a new Ireland in the sort of 1910s period. Constant, the Eva, uh, Eva Gore Booth and her sister, for example, or Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, they're imagining new possibilities for women. And while on the one hand, Ireland looks quite mature insofar as it elects the first female MP, Constance Markievicz, who doesn't take up her seat in Westminster, um, like there are, there are too many other repressive, conservative influences that come to the fore that diminishes women's position until what some people might even say until this century. Ian and then Patricia. Yeah, I was just going to say on the question of maturity, I wouldn't rule out some immaturity. <laughs> We've had I, a bit. We've had a touch. I think um, <laughs> there's a big difference between... The RIC commemoration, for example. Yeah, well, th uh, but that's, that's quite late on. I mean, yeah. I, I think things have been fortunate in the South. Mm. Um, and looking back on it, uh, you can see that actually, you know, the, the period between 1998 and 2016 was the best moment for Anglo-Irish relations. And the contemporary issues uh, that were divisive in 2016, like, um, you know, the role of women in our society, equal marriage, all of those sorts of things, um, related only very indirectly to the 1916 proclamation. So the, it wasn't as if contemporary matters mapped onto um, past struggles. Whereas when you get to the north of the border, it's, it's much tougher. And um, it, I mean, it's actually, uh, I mean, could there be a worse moment? Uh, 
to commemorate the, the imposition of the border in Northern Ireland. You're not referring to Brexit, uh, <laughs> are you, by any chance? Um, <laughs> it, it continues to be divisive. You know, it, it was a victory for one community over the other community. So um, it's going to be very hard to find a way of marking that centenary. I think, I think Ian's right that the you know the first phase of the decade of centenaries in the Republic of Ireland um, was went went very well. Went very there was a, a sense of inclusivity. There was a sense of retrieving some of these narratives that had been lost, and there was a real emphasis on the role of women in the Easter Rising, and then leading up to the nineteen eighteen general nineteen eighteen election. Um, and so there's and there was a, you know. A, an inclusive shared spirit of cooperation, I think, when it came to commemorating the Great War as well. And so that has built up a bank of goodwill, I think, when it comes to now we're entering into this second phase, which is more difficult around the partition of the island, around you know, the civil war and, and, the, and the, the treatment of minorities, both North and South. The difficulty for commemorations in Northern Ireland is that we haven't had this period of goodwill to build up, to build up a store of goodwill to draw upon. And we're sort of launching straight into what is a highly divisive and a highly contested set of commemorations, you know, in which, you know, some people feel like they, they don't wish to commemorate and they don't wish to engage. Uh, our job as historians is to is to, as, as our colleague Margaret O'Callaghan was saying yesterday in a meeting about this, to complicate the narratives, um, to draw out some of the complexities um, and to recover some of these lost voices. But, but I think it is going to be difficult. It is going to be challenging. When you raise the question of minorities, of course, and what we haven't touched on in this discussion is the position of Protestants in the South. Mm -hmm. Neva, just would you tell us how does the Government of Ireland Act mm -hmm. affect them? So I think in some ways we're very... We can be lazy um, about thinking about the partition of Ireland into sort of two homogenous blocks mm -hmm. because there were not two homogenous blocks created at all. There were several minorities, whether they were nationalists in Northern Ireland, whether they were Protestants in Southern Ireland, whether they were the Jewish community in Ireland as a whole, whether they were women, whether they were anti-treaty um, supporters. There was a whole bunch of different minorities at different points who were unhappy with this two-state solution. In, in terms of Southern Protestants, um, I think it's, you know, there were, there's a really good quote by the son of um, uh, Colonel Saunderson, who had led the Unionist movement. And he, he says, you know, I've, I've lost my country. Mm -hmm. For him, his national identity had changed and he had been a part of, you know, he'd been part of a, a sort of uh, one island unit that was part of um, Britain, but now the changing, the changing nature of the state had made him a minority, whereas he hadn't felt that he was particularly a minority in the context of the United Kingdom. So you have changing conceptions of self, um, which affect Southern Protestants for sure, but of course Northern Catholics as well. I, I, just, I mean, it strikes me that in the South, um, in the Free State and then the Republic, there is a kind of capacity to evolve. Uh, both in, in terms of relationships with Southern Protestants and also, of course, in developing a, a, a democratic party system. I mean, a system where parties come in and out of power without violent upheaval. And north of the border, that doesn't happen. And I don't think there was the capacity for Northern politics to evolve. I mean, you have one party in power for 50 years. The voting patterns don't shift very much. When the political scientists get into Northern Ireland in the, in the 1960s, brilliant American Richard Rose, just at the moment before the troubles um, erupts, he finds you know, that here you've got a political system that seems, you know, where loyalties seem to be based on religious affinities. Um, and they really haven't changed that much. And there's no, um, there's no floating vote. Uh, I mean, you will get Protestants and Catholics who will vote for the Northern Ireland Labour Party. But Rose asks them, you know, what about your second, your third, your fourth choice? And what, not 0.5% of Protestants eventually say they would vote nationalist, but 5% of Catholics say they would vote, vote unionist. Um, and of course, Craig, um, I wouldn't say he bears responsibility for that, but being a shrewd electioneer, he exploits it. I mean, he wants a system where there's a clear divide between the majority and the minority. Uh, and so um, the potential for a new kind of politics to develop just um, doesn't seem to be there. And when Craig, of course, is challenged on his you know, Protestant state, 
he points to the south and says, "I'm only, you know, they they say they want a Catholic state for a Catholic people, yeah. which isn't true to the terms of well, the constitution isn't in in place by then, but he's still taking the example uh, of the kind of, uh, of of state that Cosgrave and others are putting in place." Yeah. I think just in, whenever we were talking about the considerable movements of people um, created by the explosion of nationalism across Europe that Patricia mentioned earlier on, it is, it is important to also think about what happened in Ireland at this period as well. Um, from 1911 through to, I think, 26, you know, the population of Protestants in the south of Ireland decreases by something like a third. It's an incredible amount. Now, there's lots of reasons for this, and this is a much longer period. But also, when one thinks about what happened to Catholics in Northern Ireland, um, there are movements of people to live in the Free State, but there are also refugees from what's happening in Belfast. And, and though the sort of comparison with what's happening in Belfast is maybe not the same as civil wars happening elsewhere, um, still, you know, there's some astonishing figure, like 60% of those killed in Belfast are Catholic, yet Catholics make up a third of the population of Belfast. So, you know, there's still some, some really horrible histories here that we need to face up to as a reality that are the part of state building across the island, not to mention the sort of the refugee crisis in a way. It's just hard to get a sense of the figures, but there are considerable numbers of Catholics fleeing Belfast after what's happening between 1920 and 1922 really hard to get a sense of how many there are. I think um, the British figures at the time are around 3,000, it might be less, but there are other figures are saying, you know, it could well be up to 10 times that amount. So there's still a lot we don't really know about this politics of partition in a way, um, but I think it's very, it would be erroneous of us uh, to think of it as sort of a kind of a neat solution that ended. It certainly didn't end, and it, was, uh, it had incredible consequences on a, a, a lot of people and a lot of families for, for a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what you've really brought out is, is where, where do people go and how do people, people anticipate this, the implications of, of where frontiers are drawn and they then live with the consequences of that. And I suppose, that, you know, the other thing I was thinking about in relation to your, your comment about the, the, the things that we don't commemorate, so it is that moment, you know, the, the, the women get the vote and then they don't get really very much out of the vote in that 1920 story. And internationally what we say is this is when women march on Geneva where they expect actually that, that international national organisations will also make states enforce women's rights. And, and someone like Louise Bennett, who's very active as a nationalist, who then is in the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, for her, it's the international identity that becomes really important. I think Kiva was right to say, and in fact, I'm very conscious of it, I feel like I'm having come out of the First World War, I'm now embarking on the long road to the start of the Second World War, and I'm really worried about having to talk about those commemorations in the climate we're going through mm -hmm. at this point in the 21st century. I really don't want the 1920s to turn into the 2020s. Um, so that's the sort of um, the kind of uncomfortable commemorations or the things we don't choose to commemorate. But also, the, you know, the, I suppose the last thing I want to say is how important for many actors, even though it was failing, international cooperation was and international institutions and the, the turn to international law, that that was a really significant outcome of, of 1920. I'm afraid I'm going to have to, to, to bring us to a close, but before I do, the uncomfortable question. To what degree has the debate about Brexit, the fraying of the union, which we can see with the rise in support for Scottish independence, the demands uh, from nationalists, a sex, substantial section of the nationalist community um, for a referendum, suggest that we may be going down a road where the Government of Ireland Act, or what's left of it, let's say the, the Act itself is gone, but what's left of it is going to be challenged in a significant way with unforeseen consequences. Maeve. Oof, can I let somebody else go first perhaps in that one? <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants to go first. Ian, I see you're straining to get in. <laughs> well, I can only... Um, I mean, I can tell you how much of a mess we're in, but can't tell you how to get out of it. I don't, One thing... Um, but, to emphasise, I think, about Northern Ireland is that it's not really, the current Northern Ireland isn't really 100 years old. Mm. It's 22 years old. Um, its foundation charter isn't the Government of Ireland Act, it's the Good Friday Agreement. And uh, when we uh, think about this whole subject, um, we need to start off with, in our minds, the principles of power sharing, a kind of, you know, joint determination, parity of esteem. Uh, and so on, and um, 
Those principles are obviously, well, they were founded on the assumption that the Anglo-Irish relationship would continue in this sort of healthy way that it had been developing in the 1980s and 1990s, and that the border would become less and less important in the lives of Irish people. And although, um, I mean, I was one of the people who went to the, the Belfast Agreement after the referendum looking for what it said about um, the EU, uh, I, I mean, it's, a, it's not addressed because it wasn't anticipated that either of the um, states would ever leave it. But it's the background assumption, it's mentioned there, it was the context in which that Anglo-Irish relationship developed. Yeah, I think, you know, if we were having this conversation in 2015 or the, you know, any time before June 2016, it might be very different. But now the politics of the border are very much back in the news. I think anyone who's lived within Britain for the last few years is used to hearing more about the Irish border than they ever did before. They didn't even realise there was such a sort of concept and how could they think about it. Um, it's back in the news and, you know, I don't think anybody anticipated that that would be actually a frontier border but with an international entity um, which does change the politics around the border. It's no longer simply the question of what's happening within the United Kingdom, between the United Kingdom and Ireland. This is now a much bigger question and I don't want to speculate where it might go um, but it is a sort of a different political framing in which the border is now being thought about. As a student and, and a researcher of political violence do you feel we are wrong, as, as most people still do, to rule out the possibility of a return to conflict on the island of Ireland? When you look at the longer history, and we had substantial periods during the 19th century, for yeah. example, where there was no armed yeah. uh, activity, do, are, are we wrong to make an assumption that it can't come back? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm increasingly pessimistic about Anglo-Irish relations, and by, and by that I don't actually really mean the relationship between the two governments, because I think that's a set of relationships that have formats and foras, like international foras, which will continue to exist. Um, I'm pessimistic about the relationships between the people on, on the two islands, and I see a real uh, degradation of attitudes on both sides towards the other, and it's been, an, 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 and it's been a sobering experience, actually, living as an Irish person in Britain, but also hearing about attitudes towards Britain from Ireland and in the Irish media, I think, I think there's, there's, there's a negativity coming on both sides. And, and in some respects, one of the great tragedies of this period that we're living in is, has been that you know, the Brexit crisis has erupted in the middle of this decade of centenaries and has sort of, ca you know, has been this explosive, um, an explosion in the middle of it. And, you know, there, there are feelings stirred up around political commemoration. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, we are entering a more difficult phase where there are, you know, where the, you know we're about to commemorate the burning of our city, Fergal, uh, the burning of Cork by Black and Tans on, on the 8th of December, 1920. Um, you know, where there are, you know, campaigns of reprisals by Crown forces, where there are massacres of, of minority communities, like you said, um, Ian. And I think the fact that there's, there's, a, there's been a deterioration in our acknowledgement of, in the relationships between British people and Irish people is one of the saddest things that has happened for me over the last few years. And I feel quite, I feel quite, um, quite sad about the whole thing. And this has come about, Patricia, because of a change in the European order, but I think a, the broader international order, where there's been a retreat mm. from the kind of multilateral um, approach. Mm. Um, somebody said to me recently, an eminent academic, that English nationalism or revival of English nationalism is in danger of triggering more emphatic nationalisms elsewhere. Mm. Do, you, do you have any sympathy with that Histori as a historical perspective? I think that is the, that is the what we can all feel is happening in our you know in our in our fibres. I mean, my father is Irish, my mother was German. I'm partly interested in international phenomena precisely because my my their lives and you know my birth was a a product of a, a bitterly divided world. I think I sort of always hang on to the fact that you know even in the worst points in the 1920s and 30s, 
that states were talking to one another, even if it, as they were failing through the League and out of the League, you got the UN and, and renewed commitment to international cooperation. I think it's also the case that in Anglo-Irish relations, it's never just about Anglo-Irish relations. It's a very big international phenomena. And the, certainly when I was talking about sort of putting Britain's relations with Europe in the context of Brexit, it, when you're talking about that internationally, everybody's very conscious. They were very conscious right from the vote about the implications for Ireland. It was just staggering that people weren't aware of it in this country. That was the, sh that was the stunning thing, I thought, um, I have to say. Mm. Just a, a quick comment on, on governments as well. I think, you know, there's, there's a relationship here between history and memory and politics. And obviously politicians use history to, to mobilise support and they use it in different ways, which means that they very often don't use history in its complicated context and they distill things down to simplifications. They weaponise it. And they can weaponise it and they borrow particular bits of history that seem to make them look good and they become, you know, parts of sort of contemporary debates. And the real risk with this particular act and what happens over the next year is how do governments talk about it? And this is why, you know, they, I would have particular views on how they should think about it and they should be more attentive to thinking about the history at the time and the complications of what happened to people. But whether or not they do this and go for a simplified narrative may indeed be a sort of temporary um, issue for them because they'll be maybe out of office or back in office at the next election, but these have lasting implications on people. And that's why, you know, if, if for example, there were ministers um, watching this today, I would like to sort of urge them to think about how they intend to think about this really, you know, a, a sensitive and important mar marker that's coming up in the history of both of these islands. Politicians, you have been told. <laughs> um, Niamh Gallagher, Ian McBride, Cuiva Nick Oved, and Patricia Clavin, Thank you very much for a wonderful, uh, stimulating discussion. And thank you to all of you who have been listening to us. Thank you. Bye-bye.